Mike Petralia, CLNS Media, covered the Patriots for over 20 years. Now he's back in uh, Cincinnati covering the Bengals and the Reds and all the colleges around there. And he joins us now. We're still involved in the NFL draft. Mike, um, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> Trying to keep my head above water, Tibbs. How about you? <laughs> oh, Doing good, doing good. Well, let me ask you. I mean, let's talk about the Bengals that have left. And also T. Higgins wants to be traded, but... Uh, Joe Mixon is gone. I mean, so how do you try to replace some of these guys that have brought the Bengals stock to where it is right now? How do you try to replace those guys? Well, I think with Mixon, uh, they are going in a different direction. He was more of a north-south runner, a power runner. And I think uh, certainly uh, going with second-year player uh, Chase Brown out of Illinois. He was drafted last year in the fourth round uh, this weekend. And uh, signing free agent Zach Moss, they think they can go outside a little bit more, outside run, uh, have a little bit more speed in the uh, running attack, uh, the pass receiving attack for their running backs. Uh, And I think that's the direction they're going. And I think it's a solid uh, strategy to take. They're getting a little younger uh, with their running backs. And I think uh, they feel like, you know, with guys like Zach Moss and Chase Brown, uh, they're going to be able to do more to complement their downfield passing game. And I think uh, that's a smart move. And I think Joe Mixon's going to fit in pretty well in Houston. Uh, you know, with C.J. Stroud running the show there, it gives them a little bit more, um, you know, of a burst up the middle. Uh, burst probably the wrong word. A little bit more of a power running attack with a guy like Joe Mixon who's better uh, in between the tackles, and he will get what's blocked, as uh, Brian Callahan famously said uh, last year. In terms of T. Higgins um, and also Trey Hendrickson making trades. That's because, right. Yeah, I, I, I'm not that worried about that. I think that is kind of part of the part of doing business in today's National Football League. The agents for both of those players want everybody to know that their players are underpaid, but both players are very happy with the Bengals playing with the Bengals organization, happy to be in the locker room. Um, they know the business uh, of the NFL is what it is, but both of those players know that one of their best chances to win a, a ring this year is staying put where they are playing with Joe Burrow um, and, you know, running it back for another year here in Cincinnati. I wouldn't make, in other words, I wouldn't make too much of it. Trags, I've always said the best, the safest, the most secure strategy in the first round of the NFL draft is offensive tackle. And Amarius Mims falls to the laps of the Cincinnati Bengals. He was position ranked number four on several mocks um, by a grade that's higher than most offensive tackles, but still in the mix with the Joe Alts of the world and everyone else that got drafted above him. What did you learn last night after the pick, and how do you think he's going to flourish in Cincinnati? He's a rare athletic specimen six foot eight 340 pounds uh can run you know a sub five uh 40 he is uh 21 years of age he's started only eight college games uh but he is really a terrific athlete and you know he is not the kind of six eight 340 pound guy that Trent Brown or Orlando Brown Jr. are. Those are, they're more massive. Um, Marius Mims, uh, Marius Mims is more cut, uh, and I think he's going to fit in perfectly. And most importantly, he was the best available pass blocking tackle uh, on the board and really fell right into the Bengals' lap. When they met him, uh, they were really impressed with his. Uh, intellect and his character, his personality, all of that. Uh, and teams are going to say that certainly about their first round pick. Uh, but with the Bengals, it seemed to be a really good fit. And the thing they loved most about him was uh, his winning background. And you know, Amarius Mims last night when he was on the conference call with us uh, told us how on the whiteboard when Zach Miller, uh, Zach Taylor spoke to him for the first time, we want winners that, you know, our players are winners, especially on the offensive line. And what Zach Taylor meant by that is you've got four guys with Super Bowl rings on the offensive line. You've got two other guys who have won national titles and another, uh, another starting offensive lineman in Cordell Volson who won, um, you know, at uh, division two with North Dakota state. So there's a lot of, 
winning pedigree on the offensive line, and they believe Amarius Mims fits right into that mold. Covered the Bengals for many, many years, and they like these tall quarterbacks. Drake May was their first round selection at three, and Patriots. so yeah, Patriots. Uh, or Patriots, excuse yeah. me. Um, yeah. it, it, talk about you know, listen, Tom Brady was a gift that was a six round draft pick that uh, Nolan Oliver get that lucky. But uh, what do you think of the Patriots and and the direction they're going now? Just a couple years after Mac Jones, I think it was a pretty safe pick for the Patriots to take Drake May. Uh, He's got the athletic, um, he checks a lot of boxes athletically. There's no question about that. Um, He's going to be able to throw down field. uh, And I think the ownership, you know, both Jonathan Kraft and his father, Robert, uh, want a quarterback like that who can really entertain the fans that show up at uh, Gillette Stadium. They don't want three yards and a cloud of dust. And I don't think with uh, Drake May, you're getting that. You're getting a downfield uh, passing quarterback who can make all of the throws. The big question, of course, about Drake May is whether or not he can read progressions and how long will it take him to learn the NFL uh, mode, the scheme for reading progressions downfield. And uh, that's going to be, I think, the biggest learning curve that Drake May faces. Uh, but certainly I think it's a pretty safe pick. I mean, he again, when you talk about all of the measurables, um, Drake May has a lot of them, and I think he has the intangible uh, of being able to entertain. And that's really, I think, after the Bill Belichick era and the Tom Brady era, there's a lot, of, you know, the period between Brady leaving and Belichick running with Mac Jones. The Crafts were like, we don't want Mac Jones is a, a fine young man and a going to be still a serviceable NFL quarterback, but the Patriots want more than a serviceable quarterback. They want a playmaker, and in Drake May, they believe they have one. Will they put weapons around them? I know they already picked up K.J. Osborne. Do you think their receiver is going to be off the board in the next couple of rounds for them? Yeah, I I would think they're going to work pretty hard to restructure and revamp the offense. Everybody knows that, that uh, the Patriots did not go into the offseason with a um, a lot on the cupboard <laughs> in terms of uh, weaponry and playmakers. And, you know, if you're going to draft a guy like Drake May, you want to put as many playmakers around him so that if he's rushed to make a throw in the pocket, throw the ball towards somebody who can win 50-50 battles, for instance. And I think that's uh, what the Patriots are going to be in the process of doing here tonight in day number two of the NFL draft. I I will also tell you, I think the Bengals could be looking for a wide receiver tonight as well. The the team or the player that I'm fascinated by tonight, and it's, it'll be early on is where does lad McConkey go? Um, He is a great clutch receiver, um, you know, playmaker, much in the same mold as Wes Welker, um, Julian Edelman a little bit. Uh, but where does Lad McConkey go out of Georgia? It'll be fascinating. Talking to Mike Petralia, read his stuff. CLNS Media Online does a great job covering the Reds and the Bengals and all of those NFL and uh, MLB sports. Let me ask you: You got nine picks left for the Bengals, uh, and like uh, the Patriots have seven. So what what are the Bengals going to do mostly with those nine picks? You got what a number two? You got two number threes? Um, what right. where, what direction do you think they're going to go in? Well, assuming dibs that they don't trade up and uh, move up to, you know, tonight to try and get, you know, a, a higher uh, second round pick and they hold on to those nine picks, you're going to see the Bengals uh, address a defensive tackle position for sure. Wide receiver, uh, another cornerback, uh, because I think, you know, you're, when you're talking about the Bengals, you're looking at uh, still trying to replace a Cheeto Awuzie. Um, Bengals have a couple of options there with Cam Taylor, Britt, and DJ Turner. Um, what do you do with Dax Hill? Does he become, you know, a hybrid cornerback and move back to corner from safety where he played last year? Uh, that's that's a situation uh, to watch. What were even s- with Trey Hendrick? Go ahead. Even with Trey Hendrickson, even with Trey Hendrickson staying. Um, I would say that the Bengals are looking for another edge rusher. They uh, certainly will probably take um, on day three another offensive lineman uh, for depth on the interior. Uh, And that's where I, I think, and maybe a tight end as well. Throw that one in there as well. 
I know everybody's talking about Michael Penix Jr. and that deal that went down, um, eighth pick overall for the Falcons, who already have a quarterback they're giving a hundred million guaranteed to. Um, what were your thoughts on that pick, and maybe some other shockers for you in the first round? So, I don't have a problem with what the Falcons did there. I have a problem with how they did it. If you're going to make that move, you let Kirk Cousins know what you're doing, right? How, how, how is he in the dark the whole way there, and you decide at the last minute, oh, yeah, we're going to bring this guy in, uh, and he's eventually going to replace you maybe sooner than later. Who knows? But that, that was the bizarre part of it. But, you know, Michael Penix, by all grades, was a first-round quarterback. So for the Falcons to make that move and, and select him, I don't have a big problem with that. It's just how they went about doing it. And, you know, you see it all the time, guys. It's not so much what these organizations do is how the optics are perceived, not only externally to the media and us talking heads, but internally. How do these organizations let the existing players on their roster know what's going on, especially if they select a player that might impact them? All right, in your division, uh, how did you think the first round went in the AFC North, and, and what direction do you think some of these teams like the Ravens and the Steelers go in and the Browns next? Well, I think, you know, when you're t- talking about the Ravens, they need to replenish the offensive line, and that's no surprise there. They're in a position that dibs a little bit like uh, the Bengals where, you know, they, they like to rotate their offensive linemen every so many years. Um, but they, I think, have you know a much better reputation of developing their draft, their offensive linemen than do the Bengals. That's why the Bengals, I think, have been a little bit more active in free agency than the Ravens. So that's where the Ravens, I think, are going. Cleveland Browns, to me, are always a hard team to figure out uh, because if they believe in Deshaun Watson, uh, then they're going to probably want another offensive lineman. They're going to probably want another wide receiver uh, and, you know, add depth to a very, very good defense. And if you're the Pittsburgh Steelers, you've obviously, you know, overhauled your quarterback position, which I don't think is a bad idea. I think Russell Wilson might get re-energized there. Uh, And then again, you're uh, looking at a team that has always drafted wide receivers very well. They're going to probably do that again and give Russell Wilson, you know, one or two more weapons. Um, and uh, they also uh, are going to add uh, more to the secondary. So that's the way I read it, uh, you know, in a thumbnail on the rest of the AFC North. Man, Trags, if you look at the draft, just look at the positions. I would advise all the linebackers of the world to become edge rushers and all the running backs of the world to become uh, either receivers or offensive tackles. Man, writing is on the wall with these two positions, linebackers, running backs. It's kind of bizarre how we know, you know, the, the year number 30 for these guys. We know the franchise tag situation for these guys. But, man, it's obvious after the last night's first round that these guys are, are second fiddle to a lot of the other positions well if you're a linebacker you got to be able to move laterally you've got to be able to essentially play you know a safety position and that's the way you know a lot of these defenses regard the linebacker you know are uh, as a you know a bigger safety and can you play down on the box so i think that uh is the way the linebacker position is going um it's all about speed and tackling technique and closing Uh, because that's a a very valuable trait, perhaps in today's NFL, the most valuable trait of a linebacker. In terms of the running back, I still see their uh, uh, teams view that position as very valuable if used in the right way. And I think the Bengals, you know, are ahead of the curve there, or at least at the leading edge of that curve uh, in terms of using their running backs uh, as part of a, the passing game. And that was really why, I think, moving away from Joe Mixon, who was drafted um, before Zach Taylor got here in yeah. Cincinnati, um, you know, Joe, they, they liked Joe Mixon. They liked what he did, again, in between the tackles. Uh, but now they are going to use their running backs more as a hybrid. Uh, they're going to use them as running backs, but they're also going to use them as 
uh, pass catchers uh, in the uh, downfield passing game. All right, quickly, tell us about the Reds. or a couple games in the win column behind Ben's Cubs. Oh, yeah. Uh, they just took two out of three. No, I actually split with the Phillies, and now they've got the Rangers, but uh, kind of you know, 50-50 over the last 10 games. Uh, who, who do you like uh, between the Cubs and the Reds right now? And, and the Cubs are hosting the Red Sox, by the way. So uh, the, the way I view this division is – are the Reds going to get healthy enough? And if they do, they will contend because they are missing TJ Friedel and Matt McClain. Matt McClain may or may not return this season. Noel V. Marte, the third baseman, uh, who is suspended. And what I have seen from the Reds so far is a lot of resiliency, but I don't know what, if it's sustainable. I will tell you the, the pitching staff, Rob, uh, is better than it was this time last year because they're not killing the bullpen every single night. Um, they're getting to the bullpen in the sixth and the seventh innings instead of the third, fourth, and fifth innings. <laughs> it's always a bonus. And that's, <laughs> yeah, and so I, I, I think that's where the Reds are better this year, and that's where I think they can become better uh, than the Cubs. I actually think uh, you know the Reds, in a sneaky way, could have a better pitching staff than the Cubs, and starting rotation uh, is going to be – Again, sneak up on people as one of the best, uh, better starting rotations in baseball, especially if our favorite picture, Rob, can figure it out. Yeah, Hunter Green, Green, if he can figure out an off speed pitch, this red uh, rotation of Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, Graham Ashcraft, Andrew Abbott, uh, and Frankie Montas, I'd take that five uh, as much as any other five, and certainly in the National League. Maybe, maybe not Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a, another level above. But uh, when you talk about pitching in the uh, NL Central, I think the Reds have the potential of having the best staff in the division. There you go. Trags, you are a peach. Thank you so much, my friend, and enjoy the weekend. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm going to get some uh, get my dinner now here at uh, Paycor Stadium. So oh, enjoy. there you get go. Sleep, enjoy. Right. Yeah, there you go. Get some sleep. Watch some more of the draft tonight. Uh, Mike Petralia, everybody joining us there. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back on the Rob Dibble Show with Ben Darnell on your uh, afternoon drive here on Fox Sports Radio.